Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started on time. Welcome to the final session, Bringing Education Neuroscience Research and Strategies to Your Teaching and Student Learning, the final session of Semaine du Cerveau, Brain Week. Um, and my name is Ellen Burge, Pedagogical Advisor with MLF America. And it is really my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Ian Kelleher and Glenn Whitman to you today. Um, Ian teaches science and is the Dreyfus Chair for Research at the Center for Transformational Teaching and Learning at St. Andrews Episcopal School in Potomac, Maryland, which is outside the Washington DC area in the United States. Ian is an internationally recognized speaker and teacher workshop facilitator. He is the co-author of NeuroTeach, which I recommend, uh, NeuroTeach, Brain Science and the Future of Education. And he is co-designer of NeuroTeach Global. Uh, Glenn Whitman is a history teacher and the executive director of the Center for Transformational Teaching and Learning at St. Andrews. And Glenn is also a co-author of NeuroTeach and he is the co-editor of Think Differently and Deeply, the international publication of the CTTL. And it's my pleasure to welcome Ian and Glenn today and having attended several of their presentations um, and workshops over the last few years, I know you're in for an interactive and educational 90 minutes um, that's rooted in mind, brain, science, and it's a practical application. So it's gonna be a real treat. So thank you, Ian and Glenn and Chantal for joining us. Um, and with that, it's all yours. Fantastic. Thank well, th thank you, Ellen, uh, for the invitation. Um, love to be the cleanup hitter. That's that's baseball. I don't know what the cricket equivalent Ian would be uh, for cleanup, um, but really excited to be here this morning, um, our, our time, um, with an international audience of educators who, who really want to think about connecting the growing body of, of promising research and strategies in the science of teaching and learning um, to how we design schools and classrooms, and most importantly, work with all our great students around the world. We've been pondering this question. So we know reading from slides and talking over slides is not great for cognitive load. Just take a look at this question for a second. And we've been on this global mission to first and foremost train 100% of our school's teachers in educational neuroscience and using our experience and our work with uh, schools around the world, uh, which Ian can now show you uh, all the countries we've gotten the chance to play in so far, um, in trying to connect educational neuroscience research done at the university level or studies done in other schools to the everyday life of schools. We do hope this is the beginning of a friendship with the, everybody who's attending, whether it's live right now or who watches this asynchronously. And Ellen, you did such a great job introducing ourselves. I really don't need to do that, except we uh, recruited one of our most awesome teachers at St. Andrews. And for so many reasons, um, she's been involved in the work with us a little more quietly. We had to sometimes drag her into these events, but she is fantastic. Chantal, can you introduce yourself to uh, um, everybody around the world? Okay, well, bonjour. A tout le monde. Buenos dias. I've seen a few people uh, calling from Spain. Uh, I'm a French and Spanish teacher at St. Andrews. Uh, I've never thought I was going to spend so much time at St. Andrews. I usually, because we do travel, I usually spend around seven years. I've been there 21 years now. And I have to say that every single year, thanks to Glenn and Jan and their work, uh, my teaching is evolving. I always, even though I do have a long experience now, <laughs> uh, every year there is something new that catch my attention and that I try to apply in my classes and I'm really enjoying it. Awesome. Thanks Chantal, glad, glad we recruited Chantal for so many reasons. Um, and it's always great to have one of our colleagues who's lived this work. And we've been doing this work as a school since 2007. Um, and as a center um, for about a, 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 de a decade. Uh, we're, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna barge in quickly and say, it's, it's really important to know that the, the, we're all everyday classroom teachers. 
and and we have this unique position sitting in the in this world between research and and the everyday experience and our students help keep us grounded and make us realize why we why we're doing this abs, abs, absolutely um the way we've been trying to communicate this work for teachers and school leaders around the world, um, you know, we've written a book called NeuroTeach at Ellen Reference. You know, love you to pick it up if you feel it's the right book at the right time for you guys. And then we'll we'll share with you toward the end. We've actually created a virtual tool because we've been really trying to think about how do you bring educational neuroscience research to teachers, school leaders uh, around the world. And obviously, a digital solution always has to be considered and that was what we created NeuroTeach Global and we can certainly get you demos and whatnot um, if you're interested more towards the end of the session. So thinking about best practices in, in using the promising research, let's pause for a moment. Hopefully a lot of you have taken advantage of one or more of the great sessions we saw listed um, over the week. And we know retrieval practice and if you don't use what you're learning, you sort of lose it, right? Um, in the chat for a moment, and this is this is as much for us as for you to think hard about your learning. Um, what are some things that have stuck from earlier sessions this week, whether they were teacher led, researcher led? Um, if you could just throw in the chat so we can get a sense of what's still in your brain from earlier sessions um, of Brain Awareness Week. So we'll pause, throw it in the chat. Uh, Love you to be engaged and for you uh, to sort of let us know what's still there. And this is a great example of retrieval practice and, and some spacing um, uh, work that we do with our students all the time. So if you could list everything that you could recall or some of the big, most salient things you can recall from the sessions you attended earlier in this week in the chat, that would be fantastic. Yes. Intuition is sometimes right and sometimes wrong. Thanks for getting us started. Fantastic. And welcome from Lebanon, Nada. Again, so if you're just joining us, we're, we pose this question. What is sticking from earlier sessions this week? Um, yes, the importance of making mistakes. So in, in our classes, we need to make more room for making errors. Um, yes, we can't multitask. Excellent. Yeah, we're big proponents of monotasking. Uh, kids don't believe us, but we try. We did a, a workshop once with an airline pilot came to us afterwards and said he'd been on a, he'd, his uh, airline had sent him on a course on monotasking. And I thought that was, <laughs> that was a great thing, but I was a little scared that you need to send your pilots on a, on a course on monotasking. I love how the brain evolves. Great, We've seen some things. So again, just throw in the chat, what, what is really resonating with you from earlier in this week? Some great sessions we saw listed. Um, all our, lives. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our brain is plastic throughout our lives. Yeah, grades and feedback. We'll talk, we'll talk about, a bit about grades and feedback and, and, and grades can um, really diminish the power of feedback and feedback is the, the crucial thing for helping learning. Oh, I didn't see the sport in the brain session, but I, I find that, I know Glenn, Glenn especially finds that fascinating. This... Elizabeth, great point. Uh, oh. the emotions and cognition, identity threat and identity validation and its impact on learning. That's, that's, a, that's a huge area we're focusing on right now. If a, if a child doesn't feel like they belong and feel safe in the classroom, it's very hard for any learning to take place. And meditation and mindfulness, a lot of strong research coming out about how that can help. All of the metacognitions in capital letters, one of the most, one of the most impactful strategies research suggests is metacognition, but it's really hard to actually get it in place in your, in, in your classroom. So metacognition is a wonderful thing for teachers to work on. Emotion, the link between emotion and cognition is, is, is one of the, uh, one of the great insights from, um, from neuroscience is how it supports that link. So it's great. It's great to see this list and keep them coming. And, and uh, you know, certainly let's use the chat liberally with, uh, with questions um, as we go along. And we, we're willing to pause and stop and think about uh, the work we're doing 
uh, to together. We are going to try to model using the science of learning to teach the science of learning. So already we've done a little retrieval practice with you. If you have, and I, I you know, I've been teaching so much in Zoom lately. This is uh, I can't assume this anymore. If you have paper near you or a piece of pencil, or if you just want to take a screenshot, this is going to be a reflection tool that we're going to use throughout the morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where in the world you are. Um, after we share chunks of, of, of some research with you and strategies, we're going to ask you to consider as a teacher or a school leader, what you might keep doing, what might you tweak or adjust, what might you stop doing, or what might you start doing uh, based upon our sharing. Um, so again, you can take a picture, you can do a screenshot, you can, but we often ask our students, so I'll ask you guys, find a piece of paper, make a little sketch of what you see on the screen, and we'll keep referencing back to it after chunks of, of topics we explore together today. So I'll pass it to the good doctor and he, oh. I was, I, was just, I was just doing some stuff on the chat. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're ever in the Washington DC area, uh, uh, you are very welcome to just drop in and come see us. Um, this is, this is our, our office. Uh, it's in the middle of campus, in the middle of a, a busy school from, uh, that has two-year-olds through 18-year-olds. And, and this is our standing invitation. Love to sit down on this table. And, and chat with you. And the table in the middle of this picture is really is a really, really important place uh, in the school because it's where school leaders and teachers and really importantly, students come together to, to, to share their insights and brainstorm around what helps students learn. And um, we've now on this 10 year mission to take mind, brain and education science and uh, put it into action in our school. And this is the worst slide you're gonna see all day. There's way too many words on it, but uh, take a look on the left-hand side and look at all these words. And th these are all the different areas where we've taken research and uh, put it into action at St. Andrews. Where in this list would you like to see some research informed strategies be put into place in your school? Add something into the chat. Take a look at this list and add something into the chat. Where do you think a research informed strategy might help you? Uh, love formative assessment, so powerful. Yeah, motivation is an especially important one this year. Motivation and attention in, in, in our COVID disrupted year. And you know there is a science of motivation. We'll talk a bit about that later on in the talk. Uh, the homework on, 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 on the uh, research and homework is really is really interesting and, and, and is a um, we got a lot of impact for not too much work by just improving the quality of homework. Students were doing less work and learning more. Um, a lot of good stuff around memory strategies. We, we're really exploring the DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion, and the links between diversity, equity, inclusion and mind, brain and education, one of the areas we're most interested in right, right now. Um, how to give good feedback is, is, is really powerful for some, um, again, it's another one where a small amount of teacher professional development can lead to a really big change in student performance if we use the research and feedback. But where's this research coming from? There are many names for this field, educational neuroscience, the science of learning, they're all a little bit different in academia. Um, we've been using the, the, the name mind, brain and education which is this coming together of cognitive science and psychology and neuroscience and education research with this deliberate back and forward between academia and what's happening in real classrooms and, and real schools. And at, at St. Andrews, we're using MBE, Mind, Brain and Education, as an, um, as an umbrella. If you take a look at the list of an initiatives uh, at the bottom of this slide, these are the classic um, buzzword initiatives that many schools are working on. But we think of mind, brain and education as an umbrella for this. And, and it means that we've been, because of this, we've been working on the same initiative at St. Andrews for 12 years now. When do schools ever work on the same initiative for 12 years? 
And different people at the school are experts in, in different areas. We have great experts in DEI, great experts in design thinking and in multicultural education. And, and But in the, the common theme is how do we use insights from research and use those in everyday practice? And one of the things that's really helped us is developing a common language and a common framework. So teachers engage in different disciplines and different age groups and in different areas can speak the same language and we can um, move forward at a much greater pace because of that. Uh, this is, I think without question, the Milau must be the most beautiful bridge in the world. Chantal, I think Chantal's been there. Have you been there? Have you driven over the Milau? Uh, I did myself. Yes, I did. And we did cross <laughs> over and I was really scared. My son did see it when it, they were building it and it was just amazing. I think he was 13 or 15 when he saw that. And he was like, whoa, <laughs> he couldn't believe they were doing that. We put, we put our favorite bridge on this slide because uh, one of the, 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 the most significant papers in MBE was written by John Brewer, uh, who said that there's a gap between academic and research and classroom practice was a bridge too far. The, the, difference, the differences between these two worlds was too great. And he didn't, he, he didn't imagine that these, this gap would ever be bridged. So we created the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning, the CTTL, this research group in our school, embedded in a school to be that bridge, to sit in that gap, to translate research into classroom practices and, and to try it out and, and do some research in our own school to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what, what we could tweak. But why MBE? This is written by David Steiner, who's the executive director of the Education Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins University. So he was also commissioner for New York State Schools. And I'll give you a chance to read it. If you're not familiar with the phrase BIPOC, it, it stands for um, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, is, is a, 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 an emerging common phrase in the US. Teacher quality matters. So if there's any research out there at all that can help increase teacher quality, that can help every teacher on their year-to-year -year professional journey, we, we should be putting it into place. That's why MBE. This data comes from John Hattie's giant meta-studies. And um, he found that collective teacher efficacy, this belief that we have, this, as, a, as a faculty, the skills in the toolbox work with our students, has an effect size of 1.57. And that's a staggering effect size. And, and there's, you know, there's a little bit of a debate about what exactly goes into that number, what really is it measuring? But it, it really suggests that this, this feeling of teachers that they have been given the best tools that are out there to help work with their students, and they really have those, can have a, a significant impact on achievement. So that's another reason for why MBE. Uh, take a look at this picture on the right. This was written by one, this was drawn by one of our, our, our students who graduated two years ago, Joy Reeves. And I, I want you to take a look and just put in the chat, what's your favorite region of the brain? Just add, find your favorite region and type it into the brain. My, my daughter's is the, used to be the hippocampus because it's like a campus for hippos. <laughs> I like the coffee. I, uh, I do like the- um, There it is, finally the coffee factory got there. <laughs> I love the coffee factory, the coffee right. reservoir. Now I would, I would argue that um, of these two images of the brain, the one on the left, which is for hundreds of years, this was the image on the left was the cutting edge of what we thought of the brain. I would argue the Joy's picture even with the coffee, coffee reservoir and the question factory is more accurate because it has things like the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex in the right place. We're the first 
generation to really understand how the brain learns, works, and thrives. But how have our schools changed? How has our teaching changed as a result? We've learned more about the brain in the last 20 years than the previous 200. But how, is our, how have our schools changed? How has our teaching changed? And the reality is they're not very much because that bridge between research and schools, for the most part, does not exist. And we're starting to try to build it. And we invite you to be on uh, that bridge building journey with us uh, in the future. But over to you, Glenn. Okay, so this is uh, Ian's very playful way of talking about uh, irony. Uh, to, um, but there is a great irony in education. And we've been collecting data, about 3,500 educators so far around the world. And this is what it looks like. So let's pause for a second. What do you think of this data? Thanks. <laughs> Truth, <laughs> love it. I like Melissa's. Uh, <laughs> Right. So in a in a self-reported survey, so we know, you know, you know, maybe a little less than empirical, um, but really a great way to get going. 20% of teachers and school leaders in all school settings we've worked with, public, charter, international um, school settings, you name it, roughly about 20% have this accurate and foundational understanding of the science of learning. And our challenge is everyday teachers. Again, I teach history, Ian teaches science, Chantal teaches language. Our challenge is how do we fix this problem? That's what we were, that's the question we asked initially for our, our teachers. And now we're asking with friends and allies like you um, around the world. Now we do have something that can help you as an individual educator. And I'll put it in the chat for you. And do we want to take it in or I don't, what do we decide? Do we, do we want to? Um, um, maybe, maybe. A bit later. So in the chat, I put a link to, and um, certainly you can see it. Um, we have a short survey that again, we're not going to ask you to take it now, but you can take it on your own or better yet, Bring it back to your school or organization and have the whole school and organization take it. We will give you a free report uh, as an individual user or if you use it collectively. It is really um, the only tool out there uh, currently that is quick enough to give you some insight to generate conversation of where you currently are with your understanding of the science of teaching and learning, both in terms of mindset, accurate knowledge, and research to classroom practice uh, translation skills and your confidence to do that. What we're seeing is teachers might know more about the research, but they're still struggling, struggling with ways to bring it and make it actionable with their whole class, with a cohort of students, or even with individual students. So, uh, that's there for you. We'll reference it again at the end and, and might be a way to collaborate and partner going forward. It only, so. it only it's averaging 10 minutes to take for the, the, the thousands of people who have done it already. And as Glenn said, uh, individuals will get a, a, a breakdown report. And if you do it as an institution, you get a breakdown report and we'll talk it through with, with you about um, identifying some, some great areas that will work for you to start and think some things, simple things, next steps you can do. So uh, pass it to Ian, but we want to give you some tools or ways to bring this back to your colleagues or your schools um, as a result of this session. So Dr. K. So we're going to do uh, next, we're going to look at three things. What three things should all educators and school, uh, school leaders know about the learning brain? Put your thoughts in the chat, just a few thoughts. What should all educators know about the learning brain? Then I'm going to tell you what the most important thing is. What might. 
Neuro uh, neurodiversity, uh, social, emotional, and cognitive and uh, emotion. Right, the importance of executive functions for all students. That's important, and and the brains are very different. Plasticity, plasticity. I love that it's next to each other, so I can say plasticity, plasticity. <laughs> oh, cognitive load will cognitive load makes an appearance later. Importance of mistake making. Better Emotion. memorization skills that I saw earlier and learn and learning how to learn. That was a good one. Like that. Emotion and cognition, the link between emotion and cognition. Excellent. I think I think it's this, and I'm going to give you a I'm going to give you a reason why. So uh, I'm going to give you two options. One of these options I think is the most important. Is it option A? This kind of thing, or is it option is it option B? So one of these two, I think, is the most important thing. And put it in the chat. Which would you think it is, A or B? <laughs> I'm glad nobody's asking for a C. That's I appreciate that from the audience. <laughs> so, so B is 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 it isn't an image. It's a representation of the growth of neur of um, of neurons over time. And with this incredible explosion of neural growth from birth to six years, but then pruning from six to 14. That from six to 14, the neurons become more connected, but fewer of them. As connections, as, as the circuits are used, the, uh, the, the use it or lose it, that be, the circuits that get used get strengthened and, and more connections are made. And the, the neural connections that aren't used so much get pruned away. As a school, when we learned about neuroplasticity, the idea that the brains are de developing through our whole lives, there's research now that suggests that neurons are being created all the way through our lives in, in some regions of the brain. But the, the time where it's happening the most happens to be all the years where we're teaching our students. When we learned about that as a faculty, it was the game changer for us because we feel that this has profound implications for what we do as a profession. We always knew that teaching was important, but the choices we make as educators and how we design our schools have profound implications for the physiological development of the brains of the children in our care. And for us, it was, it was the moment where we thought as a school, oh, <laughs> we have got to be really good. Yes, A matters, but B deeply matters because it means that we have to go searching for the best evidence that there is and find ways to put that into practice in our classrooms, to measure the impact, to check for side effects, and to iterate year by year so that I'm a better teacher now than I was in September. This is my 25th year of teaching. I'm a better teacher now than I ever was in any of those years before. So this is our first topic of the three things we should know. Teachers need to embrace neuroplasticity. All teachers are brain changers. Yes, there's a significant genetic component to intelligence, but there's also this massive environmental component. All the experiences we have and how we unpack them help to shape the brain. For the better, yes, but also, but also for the worse. The negative experiences also result in neuroplasticity. So we... Um, um, so we, we, we love the work that comes out of the Harvard Center for uh, the Developing Child, Jack Shonkoff's work and others. Um, matter of fact, our journey in MBE really began with um, uh, the late Dr. Kurt Fisher, who uh, 
along with you know uh, David Daniel and others, really got the uh, the MBE field launch. But I like showing this graph and having a playful moment for a second. You know, think about the age group your schools or your, your or you are teaching targets, right? So I currently teach roughly 15 year olds in the United States, uh, 10th graders in, in our high school. And if you draw a vertical line up in mental vertical line from where you where you are, just to remind yourselves um, about plasticity and that the, the years we often have students from early childhood to secondary school graduation or high school graduation. And I'm hopefully there's some university professors in the audience as well, right? These are seminal moments, as Ian pointed out earlier, for the, the development of, of, of a child and the child's brain. Uh, we like to use the, the phrase teachers are brain changers or teachers as brain changers. Uh, we got to reconnect with an old friend recently, Dr. David Souza, um, who was one of the earlier, uh, earliest people talking about this, at least in the United States, along with Judy Willis and Mariel Hardiman and so many others. But then I want you to think for a moment, put yourself, plot your age. We're not going to out you. We're not going to ask you to do this. So don't put your age in the chat because that happened recently. I will just say I'm 52. I'm happily 52. I think I look good for my age. But if you think about putting my age here and making a vertical line, the good news, <laughs> even though the slope of the curve, be gentle, Ian, I think Ian's probably doing this to me. Um, the good news for all of us <laughs> as educators is that the adult brain can learn too. And certainly during this year of COVID school, we're still in a hybrid model. Every other week we have groups coming. We probably, I probably learned more this year as an educator um, than maybe, maybe uh, since I, my first five years. So again, a great chart or graph to use with your schools and look at the research at, on, on Harvard's website um, with your faculty. Bring this back. And these slides will be readily available after the session. So how do we, how do we bring MBE back? How do we bring neuroplasticity back in this idea? Um, well, a lot of talk about growth mindset and, and how do we change students from the I can't mindset to the I can't do this yet mindset. Yet is a big word for us. And, and some of the latest research around that is that growth mindset is all, the, the, the core component is all about having students feel that they've got great strategies for learning. Uh, John, John Hattie in his meta study found that the, the, the thing that makes the greatest difference in student achievement is using the right strategy at the right time. And so the role of teachers is to help, one of the roles of teachers is to help students feel they've got great learning strategies to, to help build this not yet mindset. I, I can find the right tool in my toolkit to make this work. Another key component of, of, of making neuroplasticity work for you is getting the, the level of challenge right. This is a, one of the classics from psychology, the yerkes dodson curve. And, and there's, you know, there's, there's some debate about its usefulness, but you know, the di research from Diamond et al. suggested it holds true for, for tasks that involve the prefrontal cortex, which is you know, all of learning, I think. <laughs> that if the level of challenge is too low, boredom sets in. If the level of challenge is too high, frustration sits in. But there's this optimum zone. We might call it the Goldilocks zone. We, we came up with the name, the zone of proximal discomfort to sort of play on Vygotsky. How do we keep each student knowing that students are different? Every student's brain is different. Everybody has different strengths and challenges with a little bit of differentiation and how do we get that zone of challenge just right every day in the class? What else helps with get, uh, putting neuroplasticity in place? Having a high bar for all students and telling them that you have high expectations of them and telling them that you believe in their capacity to meet, meet those expectations. That all makes a difference. That all students deserve a, a high bar. and put in scaffoldings in place. So, so teach students excellent learning strategies, but also have some scaffolds in your pocket. And different students need different scaffolds at different times. 
And the first law of scaffolds is that all scaffolds must be temporary. That we're peeling these away over time. That students, some students just need a little bit of extra scaffolding to, to get them to boost that feeling of, I've got this, I can do this now. And there's that feeling of, I can do it, comes peel the scaffolding away. One of our, well, one of our favorite quotes, and this I think links nicely with neuroplasticity, is uh, from Rob Coe, who's a professor in the UK. Somebody asked him, Rob, what's your theory of learning? And he quickly quipped back, learning happens when you think hard. And he immediately backtracked and said, that's vague, oversimplistic and unoriginal, but it does lead to this question, when in your lesson are students going to think hard? When in your lesson are students going to think hard? And then somebody, I think it was David Dido, added on to that. And how are you going to get thinking hard at the top of each student's agenda? And this feeling that this is worth thinking hard about, and I have the tools so I can think hard about it. And I, I, I feel I can be my full self in this room and this space to allow myself to commit myself to thinking hard and being vulnerable like that. So I love these ideas. When in my lesson are students going to think hard and how am I going to get thinking hard at the top of their agenda? I think about that all the time when I design classes. So let, oh, oh we, okay. I, was, I thought we had to keep tweak and stop and start there. Oh, yeah. we could. We yeah, could find let's one. get to that. Yeah, can we just go, go? So let's pause for a moment. Uh, we've probably given enough, uh, your cognitive load might already be at a good place. Sorry about that. So let's pause. We asked you earlier on to create this grid and it could look any way you want. But based upon our first sort of 40 minutes together um, and our discussion, very intent, uh, uh, sharing some data and then doing a little deep dive around neuroplasticity, what might you keep doing as an educator or a school leader? What might you tweak? What might you stop doing and start doing? So just pick one of the grids. Um, and we'll pause for a couple minutes here and maybe share, get some oral share so you don't have to listen to our voices all the time here. Again, this is a kind of example of we, we chunk the body of content, we ask our students to reflect and try to use it, and it should be no different really in an adult learning environment either. So if we take the slide down in just for one second so maybe we can see more of the group, anybody orally wanted to share? what they're thinking so far about what they might keep, tweak, stop, or start. It could be from our session or even maybe from earlier in the week, but I'd love to hear some other voices. I don't know how long you want to hear my New Jersey accent from the great state of New Jersey or Dr. K's English accent. Uh, not a rhetorical question, looking for answers. Thanks, Elizabeth, for jumping in, appreciate it. So I think, um, one thing that I run into with teachers a lot, and not even just new teachers, is this wide swing from high expectations to what they consider social, emotional, like protecting and not wanting to stress the children out. And, um, and, and they seem to either land at one end or the other. And so how do I get that balance of between and, and the fine tuning that that is needed, you know, on an yeah, individual I, teacher I, basis and individual child basis. Yeah, I bet you it's a dance all of us educators in this in this global audience do with every kid, especially this year, right? I mean, because you know, this is a barrier. I wish we were all in France or somewhere else in the world uh, um, thinking about that. Uh, great, great, great question. I know we sort of addressed it a little late coming up about emotion and cognition, high bar. Um, what else? I think, I think what some questions. Let's quickly answer that one in, 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 in 20 seconds. I think the most important thing is just knowing that that place exists, that it's not an either or, and the middle is, is where you need to be, but it's a long, hard journey to get there with each child. And one of the things that we've noticed 
underpinning lots and lots and lots of the research are strong, high quality relationships with students between the teacher and the student. It, it comes up again and again and again, underpins the research. And so the time, especially in the start of the year, to invest in relationships and, and, and knowing that it's a, it's, it, it's a long-term game it sort of gets you there in, in the end, but it might take, you know, for an individual student, it might take years and you might not, you might not see the end result. <laughs> Yeah. Other other points. Yes, Shannon. Thank Hi. you. Um, I uh, also work with English teachers, and I think maybe reinforcing some concepts where there are misconceptions. And I'm specifically thinking about um, differentiation, that it means all students should be engaged in grade level content and the scaffolding be temporary. Mm. Yep. There, there is um there is a little growing body of research that differentiation, at least on, from the state side, is actually leading to reducing the bar for certain kids, and I think we got to be really careful about that, um, especially in the recovery um, or growing out of COVID. Um, but thank you for that really important point. So I guess my my question related to that would be I mean we know we need to meet students where they are, we know they need to have access to grade level content. And so where is the yeah. where is the bridge? Are they engaged in practice at their level and also practice at grade level? The lesson should be at grade level. How do we adjust that? The the um the quality the quality of practice really, really matters. And moving students from very guided practice to monitored independent practice to truly independent practice and, and using a lot of um, using interleaving work answer, work examples and and and, um, and 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 questions is is a trick that seems to help using space practice and retrieval practice uh, interleaving classes so we don't do a chunk and just move on there are things that can help get an advantage uh, over time um, there's um, oh and and all, all the research on feedback. I think we get into feedback in, in in a little while. But one of my one of my favorite studies is by Kluger and Denisi, and they found that in in 38% of times the feedback students received le led to them getting doing worse. So the thing about that, 38% of the time, think of all the work teachers were putting in to giving students feedback, and the students would have done better if uh, the teachers had just opened up a bottle of wine and binge watched Netflix. Uh, it's so sad. So, so, so feedback is, is this great way to increase student performance, help students get onto, on, onto grade level and make better use of teacher time, but also free up teacher time because that's a great opportunity game. Think about where will I put that, where will I put that time back into lesson planning, meeting with individual students. I think that's a great uh, leap forward into the next part of our, our talk. If we want to throw your slides back up, Doc. Okay. Uh, so when we design professional learning around the educational neuroscience, we wanted to bring play and, and, and discussion and debate into the experience. So we want to share with you a little playful way of how we eliminate neuro myths because there's a, there are some some neuro myths that still perpetuate out there that uh we would like to get out of the the thinking of educators so we created this card game um uh, a neuro truth truth versus neuro myth card game it's a it's a 52 deck card game if you're interested in the cards we can certainly get them to you uh might be a very way to disrupt professional learning and we're going to play a little with you um, in the chat. So uh, I'll introduce the question, you'll answer, and then um, we'll explain what the research is currently saying about it. So should we do our first one, Doc? Oh yeah. So so um, first one. I'll let you. I'll, I'll let you read and, and, oh, and give it oh. your answer by typing yes or no, we oui or not into the into the chat. So oh, I'm the MC. I got okay. I got my role. So some people are kinesthetic learners, some are auditory learners, and some are visual learners. Again, uh, we meant to design these to be a little provocative too, so they'll get a little more provocative as we go along. So in the chat, yes or no. 
<laughs> oh, Melissa, great answer. I love when uh, yes uh, no. <laughs> I love when humor and sarcasm get into the chat and, and, and when we when we get to meet new people. So let's let's do want to do the great unveil, Doc. This is the big moment. Yeah, there you go. The great unveil. It's it's a neuro myth. Um, this is this is really common in in. Um, in one classic study, uh, they found that 96% of teachers in Britain believed this myth is so prevalent. We were actually fortunate enough to be on the main stage at Learning in the Brain the same time slot, the day after Howard Gardner was on the stage. Howard Gardner, who, who uh, someone said in the chat, whose research this is an oversimplification and misguided simplification of. And Howard Gardner was on the stage saying, I didn't mean it like that. Just a really impassioned, no, please don't do this. Please stop doing this. There's some truth in it. Every brain is different. We all have cognitive strengths and weaknesses, but they're current areas of cognitive strength and weakness. And we can grow all of them by using good strategies and practicing using good strategies with high quality feedback. If, um, if we attach simple labels to students, like left brain, right brain, um, either this kind of student, but not of that kind of student, it often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Instead, we should help students recognize their areas of current strength and, and areas of challenge and help them find strategies to get better in all those areas. And when we design our classes, we are not trying to match up uh, learning styles. Instead, we use multiple modalities, but we choose those combinations of modal modalities based upon what's going to work best for this class. Second one. All students, even the strongest ones, can benefit from additional training in executive functioning. Yes or no? True or false? We're not. <laughs> Shannon, I love it. Okay, so if, <laughs> Shannon might be over caffeinated, or uh, this is awesome. Thank you. Thumbs up. Love it. Uh, 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 good, good. We we clearly we're in the right audience, right? This is perfect after Brain Awareness Week. Uh, and lots teachers, of excellent. <laughs> I will tell you, uh, before uh, Ian explains the answer, which again, love seeing us, when we started our work in this field years and years ago, about 10 years ago, um, our, our actually head of school was very uh, uh, limiting of our ability to use the term executive functioning, because the way it's used, uh, um, had been used earlier in the States is, it was often connected with executive function disorder um, in psychoed testing. Um, but we all know we have we have executive function traits, strengths, and challenges. We should all teach it in all our classes. But Ian, um, love, what's the great unveil, sir? There it is. It's a neuro truth. <laughs> and so um, there's a couple of reasons here. Firstly, it's really helpful if we don't talk about executive functioning as a single thing that students are either good at or bad at. We should instead talk about executive functioning skills. There's a whole range of skills involved, including planning, coming up with strategies, monitoring progress, figuring out the endpoint, um, and and um, changing strategies if, if need be, and self-regulation all the way through this. And different students are going to be good or bad at different individual components of this, and it will change from uh, from um, demand to de to demand. Your, your child might have excellent self-regulation when playing certain video games and be able to do that for hours and hours, but not necessarily at, at, at some other tasks. So then it's also important to remember the executive functioning is, is involves a, a circuit in the brain, which is largely involves the prefrontal cortex, which is undergoing massive change all the way through our mid twenties, that sort of late stage PhD time. And, and so, and there's a lot of neuroplasticity all the way through that time. So all students benefit from getting as good as possible at some of these core executive functioning skills while they're uh, in our care. Awesome. Number three. 
Oh, the, 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 the dis we, we don't have time to address the dyslexia question apart from there's there's so much really good research around dyslexia and 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 often that's been the route for using um, some of those practices to help all students. And so the, the dyslexia question is really, really fascinating. There's there's so much excellent research and, and from that has stemmed all kinds of wonderful things that help all students of every uh, of, of, of every uh, um, age and ability level. Question three. Student brains are constantly rewiring in reaction to their environment. This means that every teacher is a brain changer, whether they believe in this or not. The yes or no, true or false, we are none. We should have maybe brought in the harder set for this audience, but I think so. <laughs> We start, out, we, start out, we start out easy. Um, when we work with teachers, we start out easy to, to, to help each teacher feel like they're already part of this MBE journey. And then we, we ramp up the stakes a bit. But again, imagine all 100% of your school's teachers believes this and knows this work. That's what we're striving to at scale when we work with uh, teachers in schools around, around the world to close those gaps. Hey, Doc, the great unveil, sir. The Great Unveil. <laughs> it's a neuro truth. Whether you believe it or not, your child's brain is changing. So be the best neuro teacher you can be. And I, and I do. No, 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 no. Don't race. I, I have a comment now. Uh, I, I do want to give a shout out. And I feel they are underappreciated sometimes. Uh, the teach the early childhood, the primary, the elementary school teachers. Um, what you do at some of the most sensitive periods of brain development. Um, social, emotionally, uh, exposure to early language, vocabulary, reading, math skills is critically important. Um, you know, I take it for granted sometimes as a, as a secondary school teacher when my kids show up and are good, very good readers. Uh, I have to always remind myself. So for all those in the audience around the world, if you are working in the early childhood space or the primary or elementary space, if I had an adult beverage, if that was okay, or a cup of coffee to give you through virtually it's all, you, it's all yours. So thank you very much. Whoop, whoop. Love it. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Doc, next one. Avoid having students. Now, here's a good one. Avoid having students memorize information. This is an outdated instructional strategy. I can Google anything. Yet. Like yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I love the playfulness in this audience. This is fantastic. We, we, we got all converged somewhere in France when everybody safely can travel. Nope. Oh, it's 100% nope. So, um, <laughs> there's normally more pushback on this one. Doc, what's the, uh, what's the other else say? What do we, what do we write in the back of the card that- um, it's a No, it's a, it's, a, it's a neuro myth. It turns out that knowing stuff is important. <laughs> Um, and there's, there's this weird skills versus knowledge pendulum thing. And of course, both are important and you should, you should aim for both. And we're, 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 pushing, we're pushing back more on knowing things is important. And this is just the way working memory and long-term memory work, that our, our working memory holds few items for a very short amount of time. And working memory can be a, a, a huge barrier to students of all ages and all abilities learning. And the, the crucial way for helping get around that is to carefully and sequentially build knowledge and skills in long-term memory over time. Our long-term memory is essentially limitless. And by uh, building knowledge and having students memorize things, it, it just frees up working memory capacity to do the work and learn the work the students have to do. I think we got one. Do we have one more? I don't remember yeah. where we got left. We do. Last one. Who's on four out of four? If you're on four out of four, this is this is a big step. Rereading notes is a good way to prepare for a test. Uh, so teachers should actively coach this skill. True, false, yes, no. We, uh... <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brent.
again, might be for, uh, for you know, more of the secondary uh, teaching and learning instruction, but um, Caroline, yep, you've done it a lot as a student. I, that was one of my strategies. Doc, what's the grain of veil, sir? It's a myth. Students love it because it, it, it feels good, but it leads to what Mark McDaniel, who the author of Make It Stick, calls the illusion of fluency. You've seen the word so many times that you believe you know it when actually, when actually you don't. And there are much better methods of studying which involve more effort, like retrieval practice, which could be as simple as taking a blank sheet of paper and writing out what you remember, something we did to you um, um, uh, earlier, or self-elaboration, self explaining it to somebody else in your own words, or space practice, allowing it yourself to get rusty before bringing it back. What uh, Robert Bjork calls adding in deliberate difficulties that make the studying harder. But because it feels harder, students don't like to do it. And oh, interleaving another, another, really, uh, another really good one. And um, Mark McDaniel says, because uh, you know, he says that students were often convinced that these new good strategies, when he has them try it out, the students feel that these new strategies are worse. And even when he shows them in the experiments that these new strategies are giving them better results. It's still really hard for the students to believe that because they feel harder, but it's because they feel harder that they're working better. So as a teacher, I'm on this journey each year with my students to help teach them to be better studiers, to teach them good studying strategies. And I know that I have a big role to play in that because left to their own devices, my students are not gonna make that change. So how do I build in retrieval practice and space practice and interleaving into my class and how I incentivize it for my students and have that conversation so they they feel that oh this is a good strategy I've, I've got this I can do this yeah so before we yeah go, go, go. so again this is our pause moment we've just done a little chunk on neuro myths and neuro truths uh, we have about another 48 cards available somewhere um, for you, where well, we could talk more about that. Um, but based upon our quick share about keep tweaking, stop and start, uh, or a quick share about myths, what might you keep doing, tweak, stop or start? Again, building in reflection time after small chunks of content delivery, we know is good practice. So we'll give you a moment to think about that and certainly share with us. We oh, yeah, the visible thinking routines. Uh, 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 excellent. The ones that are coming out of projects, uh, Harvard's Project Zero and uh, Rich Reinhardt's work, those are really good. Um, the best active methods are things like uh, retrieval practice, where you're, you're forcing students to get it out of their memory, even if it's rusty. And even if they are unable to get something out, or even if they get it out and it's wrong, and then, and then go back and fix it, that act of struggle sort of creates little bits of Velcro in the brain. So when you then go back and check your notes, it's more likely to stick. Uh, Self-elaboration is another good one. David Daniel explains it as, uh, uh, explain the subject to a moron, even if that moron is you. <laughs> so you're putting it, in, putting it in, 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 in simple terms to whoever will listen to you. Maybe you recording it on your cell phone. Chantal, I know, I know this is totally in your wheelhouse as, um, as a language teachers, and I'll put you on the spot if you don't mind, um, in terms of how you try to make things stick and practice it for an upcoming summative assessment or a project. Do you mind sharing, my friend? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, since this language is going to depend on which level we are, are we dealing with memorizing words or memorizing structures or doing a specific task? uh usually i always go uh, i would introduce the subject whatever way makes sense and then have the student get some time by themselves to work with it so it could be recording themselves it could be writing something with the material and then usually share back to the class and then go back into a group where they are going to be sharing that information um so that's some of the ways uh, i do it naturally in the class. Um, 
Yeah, that would be really the main thing. So going back, because it's language, so we need to uh, practice the uh, listening and the speaking or reading and writing, but going from doing it by yourself, doing it with the entire class, doing it in small groups, so you're always repeating the same type of thing, but modifying with the feedback of a class or your friend. I don't know if this answers your question. Oh, no, it's great. No, it's great. And again, I know we're, we're you know, we're, Again, consider us friends. We want to be allies in the journey. Um, and as we start our the third part of our session, remember we talked about neuroplasticity in the first section, neuro myths versus neuro truths. And now we're, uh, Ian's going to share some um, some other strategies and research that I would argue have really changed my teaching considerably um, over the years. So back to you, uh, Doctor. So we use the the neuro myth. Someone said the neuro myth cards to help teachers feel that they're already doing a lot of things that line up with the science of teaching and learning. So then what other nuggets can we take that are easily translatable into every, everyday actions? We wanna give you five quick ones and then talk about what do they look like in my classroom. And so the first one is the idea of cognitive load theory, that our, our working memory has a, a really small limited capacity. And as we bring things uh, uh, into our working memory, we also then, bring in information from our essentially um, limitless long-term memory and, and, and work with them and play with them. And the, we learn by then writing schema back into our long-term memory. But the, the bottleneck is our working memory capacity. And, and our, our, our cognitive load relates to that, bottle, that bottleneck. And John Sweller came up with three different types of cognitive load. And I'm going to show you them in this short video of me in a different black shirt. Cognitive load theory talks about this in uh, terms of three types of cognitive load. Firstly, there's the intrinsic load, which is the load inherent in the task itself. And it's hard to do too much about this. Secondly, there's extraneous load. which is all those other factors, such as environmental factors, or the way the task is designed, or how instructions are written, that are placing a cognitive load burden. And thirdly, there's germane load. This is the cognitive load that's necessary to learn, to write schema back in our long-term memory. The act of learning takes cognitive load, this germane load. It's important to remember that. But the cognitive resources pie is only so big. So if the intrinsic load and the extraneous load are too large, there's not enough available capacity to meet the demands of the germane load necessary for us to learn. If the total cognitive load of a task is too great, that is the sum of the intrinsic load and extraneous load and germane load. If this load, total load is too great, we are either unable to do the task or we can do the task in the moment, but we are unable to learn it, to do it later. So what can we do? No, don't Cognitive start again. Load. <laughs> <laughs> so three types of load, intrinsic, germane and extraneous. If the load is too great, learning doesn't happen. How do we reduce extraneous load? So that germane load can happen, learning can take place. Well, I think we're gonna do this in the I used to, but now I. I, I used to teach large blocks of content, information heavy PowerPoints, me talking for long periods of time. Now I, I teach, in smaller chunk sizes with more checks for understanding, a more formative assessment built in to see what's sticking and what's not sticking, and more moments where students use the information before we move on. I, I'm also done a much more careful job of designing my curriculum to build in a backwards fashion to build long-term memory. So with my year learning goals in mind, I start thinking, what do students need to build up to that? What do I have to store in long-term memory at each successive stage to free up 
working memory capacity so students can do the act of learning. Do you, have a, do you have a story to add, or shall I move on to the next number two? Oh, you did great. Like, I, I'm i like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Great. <laughs> I've, I've lived with you too long, sir. Right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not rocket science, is it? It's just, it's just like small, simple tweaks. Like when I heard about cognitive load theory, it's like, oh, that makes sense. Smaller yeah. chunk sizes, build the learning, check for understanding. Uh, we, we call it, sometimes call it um, um, sushi and bats. Smaller yeah. chunk sizes, more radar pings. But I, I mean, the one I will even add, and we've been trying to model it, is even just not reading off of slides, you know, in, in the classroom. And I mean, and, and dual coding, those are other things that you, uh, the research has got me down to. But yeah, let's go to the next one. Awesome. Oh, memory. Um, the, uh, this is a classic, the Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, that if, if you follow the graph from the left-hand side, it would start with the red dot. Uh, when it's first introduced, memory is really high, but it quickly goes down. I don't know why I'm pointing. The amount you remember quickly goes down over time. Ebbinghaus's famous forgetting curve. But with spaced practice, with space retrieval, so we let some forgetting happen, we bring it back, we still forget, but at a slower rate, the curve is less steep. We let a few more days pass for it to get rusty again, and then we bring it back. Students still forget but, at a, but at, a, at a lower rate. With repeated space practice, the amount that sticks over, uh, over time increases. So I used to think, I teach mostly 11th and 12th graders, 17, 16, 17, 18 year olds, that my students came to me with great study strategies. I now know they use terrible study strategies. <laughs> They're ineffective and inefficient. And even students who are often getting good grades are doing it with brute force methods. So the students are getting good grades. How can you make them more efficient and take three hours studying and make it two hours or one and a half hours? So I teach study strategies alongside the content, like retrieval practice and space practice and self-elaboration to help build memory. And I would say, you know, really at our school, where we see a big difference in this is how our teachers start a class period or end a class period. Um, you know, I, I teach a Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, rhythm right now, you know, and there's a natural space in there, including the weekends, for students to retrieve um, stuff we did from the previous class, the previous week, or even the previous uh, month. Um, really been transformative. If you saw how I started class 10 years ago, I took attendance who's here which is good you can build relationships you say everybody's name but there's a way to combine that really really well so that's been a transformative for me i used to, i used to be worried when my students started forgetting things <laughs> and, and now i realize that that forgetting is important and if i allow the right amount of rustiness right not so rusty it's completely gone from their memory but rusty enough that it's hard work to recall it and, and, I, and I don't grade that for points because it's meant, the students are meant to get stuff wrong. If I'm, getting, if I'm getting at the right difficulty level, it's meant to be so challenging that they can't recall it all, but it's a struggle. So I, I would grade for completion or effort. And then, we'd, then we would go over it again. Uh, I was gonna say, like, the two best teachers in our school at this are our advanced level biology teacher and our advanced level history teacher. And if you think about it, at some point between now and the end of law school or med school, wouldn't it be great if you had really good memory strategies that you could count on in the most stressful of situations? So teaching good strategies is not, is not below any teacher in the school. You're, you're never, no teacher should say, oh, my students are so advanced, this is not for me. It helps everybody. Number three, this is a bit, this is a bit energy, this is a bit of too many words on this slide, but the, the idea we've talked about a bunch of times that emotion and, and cognition are, are highly interlinked uh, in the brain. That parts of the brain are used in both the emotional circuits and, 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 and in the cognitive circuits. So emotion impacts learning. And uh, stress can, trigger a response so that information is dealt with our sort of rear lizard brain rather than our prefrontal cortex deep thinking brain. 
and and prolonged stress can have profound long-term health and mental health and physical health and even intergenerational uh, consequences. And uh, one of the all-time great pictures, which I, I, just, I was just told, look at the face and it looks like a spaniel's face. It looks like a dog's face. And yeah, once, you, once you can see the spaniel, you'll only ever see the spaniel. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. Yo. Oops. Oh, you know, like, we, we all have these experiences of our own schooling, I think, of our own school years where learning was shut down. What does Marielle call this? Marielle Hardman calls this, Glenn? Yeah, no, I was going to say the, the term we were supposed to really out is downshifting. When, when a, a school experience uh, downshifts or paralyzes or uh, learning for, for a student, whether it's identity threat or um a fight flight or, or flee response to an element um that maybe we've created as educators or their peers have created for them and, and for some students that fight flight freeze response kicks in every time they enter the classroom because they don't feel safe they don't feel they can bring their authentic self they don't feel that they belong in this community or this space and there are tremendous health impacts as well as learning impacts and so it's for any learning to take place, we have to make spaces where students feel like they can belong, where their unique story matters and where they feel safe emotionally and physically. And, and I think as a teacher, I used to think that oh, students should just leave their emotions at the door. This room is all about chemistry. And, and now I feel that that's, Chemistry is down the list, it's still important, but other things are much more important. And, and I have to deliberately and strategically work for belonging. And I have to do that every day. And, and everything that comes out of my mouth and everything that I show on the screen and everything that I put on the walls of my room factors into this feeling of belonging. And I, I, I can't ever make a mistake in saying, doing, or putting up the wrong thing. And so because, because of that, part of my every year journey has to be getting better at that. And this is a big part of how diversity, equity, and inclusion work intersects with mind, brain, and, and, and education work. But how, what does it look like in my class? That's, that's part of the magic of being a teacher. Your, your own your own skills, your, your professional wisdom of putting that into place. You know your subject, your community, your students, your school, your personal voice as a teacher really matters. What it looks like for me is gonna be, be different than what it looks like for you. And in the chat, uh, I think Besma, I'm gonna make sure I'm saying the name right, because that's- Yes. Belonging. You know, they're, they're, um, the, the answer is certainly uh, yes. Um, there's an organization that literally just changed their name that we're huge fans of called the Mindset Scholars Network. Um, and one of their areas of, of research is not, not surprisingly the growth mindset, but they've done a tremendous amount of leading work in the area of the belonging mindset. I'll put, put the new link in the chat for that organization though. Thanks, one of, the, one, of, one of the big belonging uh, in, uh, research studies was, was, was uh, telling students you have high expectations of them and you believe in their capacity to meet those expectations. Just and writing things like that on the, on the feedback to a paper really helps, really helps the achievement of, of, of minority and first generation students. Um, and so simple things like that, but, but, then, but then I'm thinking, so the researchers do this study and then they walk out. You've told them that you have high expectations and you believe in their capacity to meet them. And then the researchers leave the school. What happens next? <laughs> As teachers, how do we follow through on helping each child feel they've got that toolkit of strategies so they can meet those high expectations? So I teach strategies alongside content. I use spacing, retrieval practice. I, I, I use the science of learning to, to teach well. I use uh, yeah, all these resources that are coming in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna move on. I'm looking at the time. Four, students learn better when presented in multiple modalities. And 
and choose the combination of modality based upon what works best um, for that for that subject. I think when I started teaching, I used to. I mean, I taught how I was taught. <laughs> there was a lot of lecture. And now I still use direct instruction. Direct instruction is a really effective and efficient means of teaching, but it carries a well-being cost. You can't do it all the time. It's a great way to deliver core content and skills, but direct instruction also includes lots of feedback loops to check for understanding. Are the kids getting it? And, and moments to use it. And, and my, my instruction is not the end point. If we want students to build durable, usable, and flexible knowledge, that key of flexible, so they can take our stuff and use it in new contexts, we, we have to build the core knowledge and skills and then create projects and assignments that, that challenge students to use the information in a new context. Um, and so my, my teaching is now much richer. It still has lecture, but the lecture goes somewhere. It still has lecture, but the lecture is supported by feedback loops and formative assessment and pair, think, pair, share, and, and lots of those um, uh, visible thinking routines. The visible thinking routines are wonderful pieces to put into a lecture to transform it. I'm glad somebody mentioned those. Last one. Someone talked about motivation area earlier. There are theories of motivation <laughs> and, and they work wonderfully in schools. They, they really give us good frameworks to build from. The, maybe the most famous one is, is Detchi and Ryan you might have heard of. You might not have heard of a more modern one called expectancy value cost theory. But I think this is, I think this is really fascinating. So uh, the expectancy value cost theory says we can boost motivation with expectancy, this feeling of I can do it. So that uh, speaks to relationship building and, and using worked examples and giving using the, uh, the research on giving good feedback. Uh, value, this feeling of I want to do it. So I include in my class social connectedness and um, I, I use real world examples and even better than real world examples, I use their world examples, things that they students care about. I add in purpose and relevance. I give students choice, but not unconstrained choice. I give them carefully constrained choice and help guide choice because I know that some of my students don't know enough yet to make really good choices. I use humor, empathy, positive emotion, laughter, goofiness to try to uh, use positive emotion that feeling of I want to do it. And then I'm very conscious of thinking about, so what barriers exist? What are those barriers that I put in because I always put them in? How can we get rid of those barriers? Materials, time, prior knowledge, access beyond the classroom to, to, to experts. How can I reduce barriers? One of our favorite people is, is Mary Helen Imadino Yang, who's now at USC. And this is a great line from her. She's a neuroscientist that cares passionately about how the implications from, from her neuroscience research apply in the classroom. So how do I craft projects that matter to my students? So I used to think it was students' responsibility to, to be motivated for my class or not. And you know, this, that's still true. Students have to bring some motivation in, but there are things that I can do to my class to help foster that, like choice and their world connections and the sense of purpose and emotion and social connectedness and, and, and having students feel like they're building this toolkit of strategies that work for them so their self-confidence is, is, uh, is increased. I take responsibility for my end of building motivation. So we've uh, we've uh, given you a lot of great stuff, right? Um, and some of this is brain priming. Some of this is validating what you heard earlier in the week from other presenters, uh, teachers and scholars. Some of this is what you already knew. And um, 
final sort of keep tweak stop and start of you know the the topics that Ian just shared with you that seem to be um, the best the most well received by our colleagues and certainly the schools and we work around the world so um, keep adding to this list the good news is the slides and the recording are going to be available to you um, and we're available to you as well and we want you really to take advantage of that we love friends around the world We've been on this journey now for a decade. It is it has been transformative for Chantal, myself, and Ian in so many ways. To be honest, I actually love teaching more now that I think about the learning brain, the organ of learning every kid brings to school. But I do want to go about this. You know, there's a lot of champions in this virtual space, right? We're 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 the we're the innovators. We are out there. We're spending our Saturday, or maybe it's Sunday where some of you guys are. Um, here, right? Maybe with, with um, but how do you bring it back to your whole school was a question we started with with our faculty. So as you think about that question, uh, if you can read this slide, uh, my 52 year old eyes can't even see anything. Um, but I will say this, we've tried to create very teacher friendly resources that we can uh, train and distribute. This is our, our, uh, our strategies placemat. Um, in which we've organized the most promising research and strategies in the MBE field in one place for educators. Imagine if your whole faculty, if all your teachers had some training and understanding of this work. We also know that the early childhood, the primary brain is different in terms of its evolution and where it is. So we've actually created a new, this is gonna be launching this summer in July, an elementary or a primary placemat and we know now it looks nothing like a placemat. So we got to, we'll, we will we'll, we will rebrand it. Um, we offer a virtual summer academy um, for both elementary and primary teachers alone and middle school and high school teachers. So again, something we could continue to play um, with in this space. And then we've created a virtual tool called NeuroTeach Global. So a lot of stuff here. Um, I always say start with the survey. Um, but we want to be allies and friends and we'll just keep this slide up, but for those who can, we, we, we will stay on for some Q and A. Anybody have some questions or ideas or thoughts that now is the time to sort of share. And I can't tell you how privileged we always feel when teachers give us time or school leaders give us time to learn together. And Ellen, you, uh, uh, you brought us all together really well. Uh, I totally appreciate it. We totally appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you so much, Ian and Chantal. Thanks for being here. It's just been perfect. Um, and now you're part of the MLF community. So uh, looking forward to seeing where that takes all of us. Wonderful. Does that get us to France? Does that get us a, 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 an invite to France at some point? Because we're ready. Hang around, hang around. <laughs> uh, but I know we have global educators. So any questions, you can throw them in the chat. We can, uh, we can see it orally. Um, and we'll stay on if anybody wants to keep hanging out and know we are very accessible and reachable. But throw your questions out there if you want. We'll, we'll more than willing, uh, we bring three different perspectives from three different academic disciplines as well. And if you do have to drop off, thank you so much for being here for this final session of Brain Week. And we really ap appreciate your participation. And we'll see you again on the forum soon. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Oh, it's been a privilege to get to, to speak with you. Thank you. About the Thank virtual academy, I will, uh, let me put the link with the virtual academy there. Uh, but any questions for us, fire away or, or follow up with us. Um, I did put the link to the virtual academy in the chat. Somebody asked for it, it's great. I'll make sure to send that out afterwards as well with everything else. We'll make sure it gets out. I love there's, the, a great, uh, there's a great question about how can we introduce how the brain works to the little kids, like three to six year olds. Uh, I'm not sure what the youngest age is. We, we do to our youngest, as we go from two year olds to six year olds, we may not be like age three, but certainly at a really young age, we start talking about, uh, about their brain and the idea of neuroplasticity. And, and um, Oh, I don't have a go-to resource for that. Uh, I got some. I got actually. Yeah, if you, if we we have we have some things, but it's we find that's really we find that's really helpful and really important. 
and then we keep um then we keep sort of hitting that throughout their schooling it becomes a recurring message that you're you're you know that you're not a victim to break to your brain change right? you, there are things you can do um to help to to, to help neuroplasticity be as positive as as, as possible so using a good toolkit of strategies using mindfulness and and and, and meditation um brent you might be talking to him I, I don't know i'll let them speak <laughs> <laughs> i think you got him here we we um we do action research we we know that action research often falters in schools because it just takes too much time or or it's it's just not rigorous enough, and and you sort of do something that you, you, the results really can't be trusted too much for doing that next step. So we've been working with um, Kristen Garnier at the Science of Learning Institute at Johns Hopkins, and Beth Morling, who's uh, this is an amazing professor at uh, Un University of Delaware, who, who's uh, an, an expert on, uh, on on research methods, to come up with a super streamlined action research protocol for busy teachers. That, that, that helps teachers construct action research questions and helps them connect validated uh, research tools to, to use in, in, in their studies so they're not creating research tools from scratch and, and, and helps streamline a, a, a streamline a process. So if you get in touch with we'll, uh, that, we can help you sort that out. But um, Beth Morling has a great website and a great book on research methods. And, and I see in the chat, Marie, um, maybe you and we can connect you and Chantal for the translation a bit. Maybe Chantal, if you can just direct message um, just to help out with that, with that translation because we like new friends. A question um, in relation to what Brent asked, a part of the um, Leadership Academy when I attended was, a t was visiting John Hopkins and is yes. that still part of the experience? You know, we, uh, uh, it, well, it is, uh, we uh, virtually, we don't know how to do that yet, um, but certainly that was, and, and um, it, it's interesting. I don't know around in Europe or in other parts of the world, we've been really fortunate to find some university-based researchers who want to directly help teachers. So Ian re referenced uh, the Johns Hopkins group at the Science of Learning Institute. There's a group called Research Schools International at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Uh, Denise Pope and her challenge success team at Stanford. Um, reach, again, we, uh, I, I appreciate that Ellen and the organizers gave us 90 minutes. Uh, we will share and connect you and collaborate and have fun together any way you want. Uh, Craig Mertler's book is great, yes. Ian, but, even, but even Craig's book is, it's too complicated for teachers. It's written by, an academic thinking what a teacher can do <laughs> whereas we sort of started with his and, and and made it this is made it something that can happen in an actual school reliably and again we, you know the way, our, the way our yes. teachers oh sorry the way our teachers talk is they want to do action research that impacts the students that are in front of them this year right we we know random you know uh you know, random control trials. Yes, they, they have their place in education. Um, but that's the thing we keep thinking about, you know, and so what can you do in four or six weeks with a strategy you might try? Um, a new strategy, an old strategy um, is something we think about a lot. We also, we, we have this, we'll talk to many people about this. I think, um, um, who came up with the line, David? David Weston in the UK came up with the line, a teacher is more likely to have an impact if they are aware of the impact they are having. That there's, there's a residual effect of being a teacher who can do action research, who does occasionally do action research that persists even when you're not doing action research. There's a there's heightened, people feel there's this heightened sense of awareness of I'm gonna, I'm seeing this problem, I'm trying this thing out, and I'm monitoring what the what the outcome is going to be, and and, and so there's we, we believe that there's we haven't tested it yet, but there's a lot of um, very thoughtful people who believe that there's really could be something in that. 
Um, how's the, the the framework is is often used as a, as a takeaway, as a leave behind rather than a direct teaching tool. And so when we work with schools, we 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 try to take a journey that we did today, where we use neuroplasticity as this gateway of of you know my our children's brains are really changing. We need to be good. We use the some of those other activities like the, the the neuromyth cards to help teachers feel like a lot of what they're doing already is already being validated by research so teachers feel like they already have started on the journey and and then we do something like the last exercise to help them identify one or two areas of research where they can take something like cognitive load theory or memory strategies and use it directly in their classroom and we help teachers uh, in that translation step of taking something like um, you know, retrieval practice memory strategies and coming up with an action plan for this is how it's going to look in my fourth period uh, English class. Yeah. Hey Doc, can you put up the, uh, the uh, placemat again? Shannon asked a question that carries connects with what you just said. You know, so, you know, Shannon, you asked, how do you introduce, I'm assuming you want to introduce this to your colleagues. Um, you know, the field is vast, right? You know, we, we gave you a sort of a 30,000 picture of the MBE field. And if Ian, you could throw up the uh, placemat again. I'm having a computer brain fart right now. It's, it's, it's the fan's gone on at super high speed and it's not happy. Okay. All right, let me, let me do that. I'll do yeah, it's that. coming back. I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad, glad the F word travels globally. But essentially, when we created this strategies placemat in the present mode, and again, we could share more about this with you, we wanted to do two things. One, can we organize the most promising research and strategies in one place? So if you notice, again, this is more middle school, uh, secondary school focus. We, we created three sort of chunks, one around sort of curriculum pedagogy, the great content and knowledge we want to stick and we assess for at national levels, but very rarely on a, on, a, on a resource for educators, do you have something around well-being and emotion paired with cognition? The middle column is about well-being and obviously the third column is around achievement. The goal is not for every teacher to do everything on this placemat. I mean, Chantal could focus, tell you what she's focused on in the teaching of languages. Um, and introducing these, as Shannon said, at the right chunk size, but also giving um, power to the teachers as the experts to figure out what they need in their context with their kids is really important for us. Chantal, is there a place you've gravitated towards on the placemat that you might want to share? And again, we could talk more about how to get this to all your teachers. Um, and look, she's a good modeler. She actually has it in hand. Fantastic. Uh, I I have to say that it depends on what um, type of challenges I find in the class. So right now I'm kind of focused on feedback because we've been talking a lot about what is working and the fact that kids are not reading the feedback. Uh, is it really useful? Are we spending too much time on it and not having anything? So uh, the feedback part is something that I'm uh, uh, going to right now. Um, and it, I, I kind of move around. I don't have one specific thing. It de really depends on what I'm encountering in my classes. Um, right. And when I don't know how to deal with it, that's when I will go and try to identify something that will help me. So that's my uh, dictionary. No, no, you said it perfectly, right? It's, it's you know, matching uh, the learning opportunity, challenge, learning objective, right? As Ian was talking about um to the right strategy at the right time right and i think again our we're teacher led we're school based so we try to make something teacher friendly that every teacher could have in their workspace or um roam around with so i know some people have asked how do you get into this world um email us we'll we'll we'll, we'll certainly share um how how we can get it to you guys um but again imagine if all your teachers were in the space you guys are right now Imagine if they got all the answers on the true, false, right, right? That'd be a great goal nationally um, or in your district or in your individual school. So um, 
love to keep on the friendship. I, I know it's, it's uh, we'll stay on a couple more minutes, but um, no, we're very accessible. 52 cards. Can you, can you get the Maslow's pyramid question right? Can you, can you, can you get the Myers-Briggs question right? Can you get the crossing the, the, the center line question right? There's some great cards there. Yeah. So uh, again, let them play, not our Nada. I, I um, for the adult learner, um, it's interesting. When we created NeuroTeach Global, the virtual platform, we storify the experience for teachers. Um, so the, the Ian showed the other slide. Um, this is a web-based uh, platform. If you go to neuroteach.us, you'll be able to see it. Again, we can get you a demo, a free demo. Um, if, and it, it chunks the promising research and strategies into four tracks and micro courses. We got a big grant from the from a foundation to do this. You could bring it to 100 percent of your teachers. Comes in 10 minute bursts, and 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 so um, you know I did I did a chapter of it making toast for my for my children one morning. It, it, so it's, it's designed to fit around the the time scale of, of busy teachers, and it, it challenges you. Once you've done some work to make a, there's a real world challenge where you've got to create a small artifacts with related to your own class and you upload it. And then you get real live feedback from a real life human being teacher that we've changed, that we've, that we've, that we've, that we've trained. And, and so there's, it, it tries to take the research and make it come alive and you get a chance for some feedback with an MBE trained teacher. It's an ongoing journey we don't want it to be it, the one and done research doesn't work so how do we make this on this ongoing iterative journey of okay i'm going to try something out let's see how it works okay i'm going to try this little thing a bit differently so why don't we let's wrap this up our, our twitter and email are at the last slide when we when we wrote our book neuro teach uh we borrowed a um a, a piece from um can't remember who Ian, you'll remember. I'm having a senior moment, a 52 year old moment. We hope this this Brain Awareness Week um, program that was really awesome, awesomely set up, has changed your brain a little, and that we contributed to that. Your brain is a little different. 90 minutes after hanging out with us, consider us as friends. And the last thing again, what were you thinking before this workshop began, and what are you now thinking? I think we'll leave it at that. Um, and I'm going to go out and maybe hit some golf balls this afternoon here in, in DC and work on my, my game and know that we want to be friends and allies in this work, uh, as, as we go forward. So Ellen, I think that's the best we got for this awesome audience. It's perfect. What you got is perfect. <laughs> Thank you for starting us all on this journey and being here with us. Thank you for joining us participants. Great to have you. And thanks for your active participation. It's an honor to be asked. Thank you so much, Alan, for, for having us here and for, for spending some time with you this afternoon. It's just, it really has been a privilege spending time with this amazing group of people. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. Au revoir. Thank Merci, you so bonsoir. Merci beaucoup, Chantal. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.